We're turning to the book of James. And chapter 5, just before 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, Jude and Revelation, you have the epistle of James. We're reading from chapter 5 and verse 7, please. Let us read these verses carefully and let the Lord minister to our hearts. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman, or the farmer, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye, and I believe he's speaking to some of you here, some of us here this morning, personally, <coughs> regarding patience in some area of your life. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another. That's a strong word you'll be seeing when we come to it. Grudge not one against the other. And if you have a marginal reference, it'll say groan or grieve not. There's a lot of that going on in the church today. Brethren, lest ye be condemned, behold, the judge standeth before the door. Well, God is the judge, not you or me. Many things we try to judge which we have no right to judge at all. Take my brethren, you'll have the word brethren three times, you have it in verse 9, you have it again. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. There's nowhere else in the word of God that you get this phrase here. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. I only wish we were as tender as the Lord. I wish I was. I wish that I was as tender hearted as the Lord. But above all things, my brethren, swear not neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of the faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And we'll end the reading there. And Lord, the Lord will bless to us the public reading of his word. Whenever I was in the CID department of Strand Road in the, in the mid-70s, there was a detective superintendent there by the name of David H. McNeil. He just had to look at you and that was enough. He used to come to the front door of the CID office and facing him would have been nine or ten men and maybe three women working at desks. 
And he'd come to the door, and he, the stillness, I can even feel, I was thinking about it the other day, I can feel the stillness that came over that office where men were fooling and capering about at all sorts of things. And the stillness came over. And then he'd raise his hand and he'd do this. He never called you by your name. He never called you by your rank. That's all he did. And when he did that, you came. And just a bit like the teacher at school. Now, I was thinking about that the other day, and I was thinking of the quietness and an element of fear that that man put upon the people. And I was thinking, you know, that in this verse of Job, be that the uh, judge standeth at the door. But some of these moments now, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do that to the church. Come up hither. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And the dead in Adam that were saved from Adam will come up and out of the seas of the world and out of the graves of the world just with one shout from our master. And they'll be out. And our text is this morning that verse in, uh, in chapter, in, in verse 9 of chapter 5. Behold, he standeth at the door. The door. Now, according to the Greek scholar Zodiates, the expression here is certainty, proximity, and eminence. He standeth, E-T-H, at the door. And my friend, he's standing at the door of heaven this morning. And he's about to beckon his people home. Out of this cursed world that gets worse by the hour. Now six times in verses 7 to 12, the word patience, endurance, long-suffering in different forms is referred to. So patience being the operative word, what are we expected to be patient with? When you take a passage of Scripture like this and you take out that word patience and long-suffering and, and as it connotates right through the verses, the Holy Spirit is telling us now there's things that you've got to be patient with. And you and I this morning have many things in our life, and I know in my life, that we need to be patient with. Because so often we lift our hand and we make a move and we say a word and we wreck things. And we have plenty of Scripture for that sort of thing. Even Moses and Peter. Men who moved when they shouldn't have moved. And men who spoke when they shouldn't have spoken. And we're all in need this morning of patience of one sort of another. But here, James, this practical servant of the Lord, doesn't leave us in the dark. He tells us here that there's things that we need to be patient with. And the first one is in verse 7. Keep your Bible open and look at the Word of God. Because if God's going to speak to you, he'll have to speak to you through his word. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband, man or the farmer, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. So the first thing that we have got to be patient with here, according to James, is with the seed. They have to, we have to wait for the precious fruit of the earth. This precious seed, the grapes and the corn, was what the nation needed. Physically, materially, they couldn't live unless there was a crop. So whenever the seed was sown, it was precious seed. And we know that from Psalm 
126. You've often read those verses. He that goeth forth bearing precious seed. He that goeth forth weeping. Bearing precious seed. Now for a long time I could never understand what Jesus was getting at there when he talked about the sower weeping as he sowed the seed. And I'll tell you why. Because the seed that he was sown was the only seed that he had, and that's why it was precious. And as he sowed that seed, he could see his wife, and he could see his family, and he could see the winter, and he could see the storms. And he's praying as he sows it, if it doesn't take grip, if it doesn't take ground, there's going to be nothing for them. So he's scattering the precious seed, weeping. And he has to wait for the return. And the farmer and the husbandman had to wait and watch for the early rain in October and the latter rain in late April and May. And this farmer could do absolutely nothing more than what he has done to bring the precious fruit out of the earth. And my dear friend, we can do nothing more either to bring Christ down from heaven, let it be in his return or in revival. There's things we have to do. But we can't dictate when the Lord will come, or we can't dictate a revival blessing across our land other because it's in his hand. But there's things that we can do. And I've been thinking about this latter rain. And oh, I'm impatient at times. I just long for the latter rain. I long for the Lord to descend upon us with floods on a thirsty land. Oh, for a mighty revival. You see, we're living away out of the norm altogether as believers. David says, I thirst for the living God. He knew that he was alive. He thirsted for him. He wanted something real. He was tired of deadness. He was tired of carnality. He wanted life. Now come across that wee verse in Joel where it says, Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The precious seed. We've got to wait on it. There's the expenditure was on this field that they sowed upon. You see, it was costly to get this vineyard and these fields to a place where they waited for the early and latter rain. There was a lot of work. There was ploughing and there was taking out the stones and there, and, and there was sowing and breaking up the fallow ground and doing what they could do. In Isaiah 4, God says about his vineyard, what could I do more for my vineyard than I have done? And you know, there's nothing more that God can do for his church in Northern Ireland this morning than what he has done. And then why are we not enjoying the latter rain? Why are we not enjoying the floods on this thirsty ground? There's nothing more he could do, he says, than what I have done. What more could he do? My friend, it wasn't precious seed that it was, that was sown. It was the precious blood of Jesus Christ, his son, at Calvary Cross. He could do no more. Nothing more. Oh, may we cry for the early and the latter rain if it was only to cry because of Calvary. If it only was to cry because what Christ has done for us and the price that he paid, how or why should we live in the way that we are with a risen, exalted, and glorified Savior? And do what we can, for he has done what he can. But not only there's the precious seed that we need patience with, and this is a very practical point, and it needs to be hammered out in these days. There's problem saints that we need to have patience with. Look at verse 9. Grudge not one against another, brethren, 
Lest ye be condemned, behold, the judge standeth eighty eight before the door. Now I can tell you, my friend, this morning, from 40 years serving the Lord, if God's people, many of them in many churches, would realize how close he is to coming, they wouldn't carry on the way they're carrying on. You see what it says? Grudge not, grieve not, moan not, groan not. That's a powerful word. Lest you be condemned, where? At the judgment seat. Because if he's standing at the door, and he is standing at the door, the judge of all the earth will do right. And if he's standing at the door, and he's going to come at any moment before dinner time, we, the people of God, will be before, before the judgment seat of Christ, and we'll give an account. God forbid if we go groaning and mumbling and criticizing and condemning. Do we realize how close this is? Think about it. Are we spending our time bickering and fighting and arguing? One of the marks of a spirit-filled man or woman is not, is not to say they're filled with the Spirit. Anybody can say that. Nor it is not to pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. One of the marks of a spirit-filled man or woman is the fruit in their lives. And the one of the fruits of the Spirit is long-suffering and patience. And if a man or woman's filled with the Holy Ghost, they'll not be criticizing and they'll not be condemning and they'll not be tearing their brothers and their sisters apart. Because if, 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 if we're not living right in our homes, in the church, and in the world, and at our work, people will know it. And if we're not filled with the Holy Ghost, we're filled with carnality. The flesh. Paul says we're babes in Christ, we're still on the milk. People save 30 and 40 and 50 years ago, they're still in the milk. They're still gurning. They're still criticizing. They're still slandering. They're still judging. How we can try one another's patience. I know that. And I know that there's things go on around us that try our patience. But how do we handle it? Just because someone in the fellowship doesn't see eye to eye with our views, or they come in with a different version, or come in with a different dress, or come in with a different doctrine, it doesn't say that we go about moaning and complaining to them or to others. There's channels. That word groan, another rendering of it is to sigh heavily. <sighs> you feel like doing that at times? If we believe that the judge is standing at the door and he's his hand on it and he's ready to swing it open, We'd get our eyes off many of the things, my friend, that we have our eyes on, and we'd get them on to perishing souls and backslidden souls. I'm sick. You know, I used to hate the, the term Northern Ireland Christianity, but I don't hate it any longer. And I don't want to make it perfectly clear. Because there's a brand of Christianity in Northern Ireland, and it's all ritual and it's all tradition. And if you don't dot an eye or cross a T with somebody else, they're away. It was said in the meeting the other night, a quote I never heard and a quote that I cherish. It was said the other night, we need not be afraid of change as long as we change not the truth. You see, we get on our wee hobby horses, for instance, with versions. 
Well, I want to say this, that every version that's out doesn't change the truth. Some of them do. And you know very well where I stand on versions. I, I use the King James. I hope to always will use it. I think it's the best that we have. And I've always said that and I've never changed on that. But that doesn't say that some of the other versions are not good too. Because there are some versions that change the truth and I would have nothing to do with them. But there's some versions that complement the truth. There's no use in getting onto a wee hobby horse just because we don't know what we're talking about. Isn't it amazing how we will fight and how we will squabble over things and yet they're lying on the street drunk on Saturday night. My friend, this is reality. I heard of a man not so long ago who was a backslider and he was drunk. And his mother said to him, if you die the way you are, you'll go to hell. And he said, if I went to your church, that's just what they'd say to him. And they'd look down their nose at him. Where's our priorities, my friend? One of the Puritans said, a critical spirit is not a working spirit. And if you have a critical spirit against any brother or sister in this building, then you cannot be working and evangelizing in the school. If you're, bow, if you're speaking behind backs, then bow out and let the Holy Spirit have his way or else put it right. We have enough to do to look after ourselves than to be policing the countryside. I think of that lovely story where Mary broke the alabaster box. It comes back to me continually. And I'm sure if some of us would have been there and if I would have been there, I'd have entered into the condemnation with Peter, James, and John, and Judas. Judas wasn't the only one condemned. He says this ointment, this valuable, precious ointment, breaking it and wasting it and pouring it out. Who does she think she is? And it says they all rose in indignation against Mary. And that alabaster box, the cost of it was more than a man's wages for a year. She had gathered it up. It was all that she had. She kept it for that day. She wanted to show her love and her worship to the Lord. And she wasn't allowed to do it by Peter, by James, by John. And I love the way the Lord Jesus dealt with that. Because like a flash, he turned on the whole crowd them. He said, let her alone. Let her alone. She has done what she could. Man, you'd have thought John would have come out on her side, wouldn't you? And when Jesus says, let them alone, you let them alone. For he's at the door and condemnation is near. We need patience with the precious seed. We need patience with problem saints. We need patience with the prophets suffering. Look at verse 10. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord. for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. What do we know this morning about the affliction and the suffering and the patience of the prophets? Very little. What do we know what Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and Elijah suffered? And James calls them, and I love this, brethren. Brethren. Both in patience and in suffering, he says, they are an example to us. 
for an example to us of suffering. Why did these men come under such fierce persecution? Why is James drawing them out of the Old Testament Scriptures in order to encourage us and to order us to have patience in our suffering, in our trials, in order that we might hold forth? That's why he's doing it, in order that he might encourage us. But why is it? Now you look at the verse, take my brethren the prophet who have spoken in the name of the Lord. It was because they had spoken in the name of the Lord that they're under persecution. Now, Job wasn't a prophet, and he refers to Job next. Job was a farmer. And let me tell you this morning, you don't have to be a preacher or an evangelist or a prophet to come under the wrath and condemnation of men that hate you. You can just be as much afflicted this morning in your work whatever that may be. These men come under suffering and affliction because of their undiminished, unmovable clarity of the Word of God. They were thus, saith the Lord, and they paid the price because they didn't prophesy smooth things and were expected today to prophesy smooth things to please the people, but we can't do that. We need to be prepared to come under affliction for truth. Those that endure this, they were counted happy. Do you see that? That means they were not only happy within themselves, they were admired by other believers. Other believers took notice and they said, look, look at these men, look at what they've been through. Look at the affliction. How can that be? I know people in this assembly this morning, and people have said that to me. How on earth does that particular person do that? How, how, do, how, do, how do, does that particular person carry on? You see, we, we just because everything's doesn't say because everything's happy and everything's good that that's the only time that we should be enjoying life. No, the psalmist says, I will trust him in mercy and in judgment. When the mercies are falling upon us, when all's well, when everything's great, when everything's powerful, and everything's going well with us, and all's great, we can sing, I but in judgment. Then look at verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. <laughs> You've heard of the patience of Job. And I've seen the end of the Lord. I love this quote from one of the Puritans, Manton. He says this, The beginning is the devil's, and the end is the Lord. I'll tell you, the beginning with Job was the devil because he had to get permission. Seven sons, three daughters, 11,000 head. Boils from his feet to his, to his kind of in the ashes. Potsher, the beginning was the devil, but the end was the Lord. My dear friend, whatever affliction you're going through this morning, whatever trials hitting you this morning, and whatever the devil's doing to you this morning, remember this, the end is the Lord. And he'll have the last word. Look at that phrase, very pitiful. That the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. I can't explain that because I can get nobody to explain what it means. It means full of compassion and sympathy and large-heartedness. I tell you, for a long time, Job didn't see any compassion, any sympathy, or any love. Oh, there was a period in his life when the dark cloud surrounded him and there was no breaking through. And even the counselors that come and lied to him, forgers of lies, and they told him lies. And every, his friends had forsaken him. His family had forsaken him. His wife had forsaken him. He says, I'm holding on just by the skin of my teeth. And my bones are sticking out through my skin. Ah, 
Ah, but God was pitiful to him. And he went through it all to get the blessing after when God recovered all for Job and more. My dear friend, hold on this morning. Have patience in the trial. Have patience in the storm. Have patience this morning. He is very pitiful. And he's full of compassion and tender mercies. And he'll not test you more than you're able to bear. Take the example of the prophets. All right, Isaiah was, stone, was sawn asunder in him living. All right, Jeremiah was cast into the pit and didn't see much. But they were happy. They were happy. Because they knew they were in the will of God. Briefly now, precious seed, problem saints, prophets suffering. See the profane speech in verse 12. But above all things, my brethren, swear not either by heaven, neither by the earth. Now there's a phrase at the beginning of this verse that makes us cock our ears. Do you hear what he says? But above all things. So this is very important. Of all the things that he has said before, above them all, he says, swear not, either by heaven or by earth. Now some people have very foolishly taken that as far as the courts of law is concerned. And I've sworn oaths hundreds of times in the courts of law and it never troubled me because that's not what this is speaking about. This has nothing to do with judicial things. But it says above all things, so it must be serious. What he is saying here is on the eve of the Lord's return, be careful with your tongue and your words. Because we know that James is a book about the tongue. Be careful now. Be very careful with your words. Because you know, believers swear and they don't know they're swearing. There was a Methodist man and he was as straight as a rush. And I mean it. He didn't smoke, he didn't drink. There was a number of them in the town of Derrigonley where Pat's from. They never smoked, they never drank. They went to the church twice on Sunday. They were exemplary in business. There were honourable men, the three of them used to walk on Sunday afternoon, go for a walk. I don't know whether they were saved or not because I'm not their judge. But one of them had a, two of them had shops in Derrigonley and one of them had a, had a bicycle shop and, and, and they used to call this man Jinx. And I often wondered as a boy, he was only referred to that. Now, why he got that name was he employed a young fella at 14 to work in the shop, and every time something happened, the, we, the, the, the boy shouted out, Jesus. And the man says to me, you don't be saying that word in here. You say jinx. It might sound funny. But was there any difference? Is there any difference in saying, O oh, Jove or O oh, Jehovah? Is there? Because it's the same thing. Is there any difference in saying, O oh, Gosh or O oh, God? See what the verse says? But above all things, my brethren, swear not either by heaven, neither by the earth, neither be any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. In other, other words, you say yes, or you say no. And we don't know what yes and no is hardly now. And the church either doesn't know. The 
Lord expects us to answer questions. When someone says to me, can a believer marry an unbeliever? I say, no. According to the word. Do you marry same-sex partners? No. You just need the two-letter word. Do you believe... Do, do you believe that divorcees, that you can marry divorcees? No. Do you believe in the virgin birth? Yes. Do you believe in his vicarious life? Yes. His vicarious death? Yes. Do you believe in his virtuous life? Yes. Do you believe in his visible return? Yes. And a thousand times, yes. Do you believe that we should have the Lord's table on the Lord's day? Yes. Do you believe that we should baptize in the tank of water? Yes. Do you believe that there should be membership in the house of God? Yes. Today we are just like the world and we're just like the politicians. We call evil good and good evil. Now I want to finish with this as we close now this morning. Verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any, any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. There's one commentary on that verse that I want to quote to you. And here's what he says. And it's simple. Because the Lord is at the door and he's coming soon, whether we're suffering, whether we're sad, or whether we're sick, we've got to keep praising and praying and rejoicing. Is any among you afflicted? Do you feel afflicted this morning? Are you suffering this morning? Are you sad? Are you downhearted this morning over some recent thing that has happened to you? Are you sick? Are you sick this morning in body? Put them all together. You're suffering, you're sad, and you're sick. What are you supposed to be doing on the eve of the Lord's return? Praising and praying. I tell you, that'll cover it all. If you get into the prayer meeting tonight and start praising and start praying, you'll lose your sight of others that annoy you and pay, things that expend your patience. You, you'll lose sight of them and you'll get taken up with the Lord and so we all will. And you know, there's a lovely wee thought here too. It comes from Plummer, one of the Greek students. And he says this, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. And he is in there that singing's accompanied with a musical instrument. He says, a singing the psalms accompanied with a musical instrument. I tell you, if we could get a couple of musical instruments and we could get into the spirit of prayer and praise, a lot of our suffering and our sadness and our sickness might go out to the window. Behold, James says, he's at the door, the judge. He will do what is right. May God have mercy on me. Let him judge others. May God have mercy on me. For I've got to stand before him. So we've got to be patient with the seed and with the saints 
and in the suffering and with the speech and with the singing. Amen.